What's going on, team? Welcome to an episode of the Keep Going Podcast Season 2. This is your co-host, Luke Wheat, coming out of Knoxville, Tennessee. Before the show starts, make sure to follow us on our socials. Okay, Twitter, the Keep Going Pod, Insta, the KG Podcast, and YouTube, at the KG Pod. Just a reminder that we are not psychiatrists and not psychologists, just a couple ex-athletes trying to make a difference and end the stigma of mental health. Thank you guys for listening, and let's get to the show. That keep going moment. My keep going moment. That's my keep going moment. Let's keep going. Welcome, team, to episode 59 of the Keep Going Podcast, Athletes Shining a Light on Mental Health. This is your co-host, Luke Weed. I'm joined by Jackie Tripp and Zach Hatton coming out, our guest today. Coming out of Canada right now. Zach, where are we at in Canada? We're in Peterborough, Ontario, uh, about an hour and a half east of Toronto. Uh, so, yeah, big lacrosse town, uh, Peterborough is. So, that's where we're at currently. Perfect place for you, then. Perfect place yeah. for you. Jackie, where are you coming out of? I'm coming out of Massachusetts today. I got my Michigan crew neck on, though, because I'm cheering for blue tomorrow. Sweet, sweet. Uh, I'm a over in Maryville, Tennessee, and with my buddy Brody, uh, he took me fly fishing for the first time yesterday. He didn't catch a thing. Um, he got three or four, so it was, it was a good day. We were out in the wild, um, you know, in, in Cherokee National Forest, so it was cool to be outside and in the river, um, even on a cold day, so it was nice to get get in tune with nature. Um, pretty Enjoyed that pretty well, so that was a good start to the weekend. Um, Zach, you know, we, we kind of talk about it and bring guests on, and the first thing we ask them is, and we've been switching it up a little bit, but, you know, when you're having a good mental health week, um, what's something that you're doing and you're like, man, this week is clicking, I'm feeling really good. What's something that you're getting into in a good mental health week? Yeah, so I'm an athlete first and foremost, so love to get get runs in, get to the gym. Uh, You know, over the holidays, I took a little bit of a break, so it's been a little bit sluggish uh, getting back into it, but Definitely going to the gym uh, is something that happens on a good week. Um, I like to read. So if I get a chance to, you know, sit down and read for an hour, that's um, something that I really enjoy doing. I just graduated um, law school in the UK. So, um, so yeah, and something that my partner and I do every night. Uh, it's kind of going towards what last week's guest was talking about with the gratitude list we, we do favorite thing about the day uh it's something i got off a new or another podcast so favorite thing about the day just kind of reassures you that there's something that happened good in the day even if you're having a down day so always end the day on a high note i love that that's a tool that uh some teachers use as well i know i used to use it in middle school a little bit more than i do in high school High school, I kind of get away from my methods a little bit too much, probably. I, I don't work on as much of a schedule with the older kids. But middle school kids, I know a lot of the middle school teachers I used to work with were, okay, we start off with one thing good or one thing you hope that happens during the day. So I absolutely love that. Um, so, Zach, thanks for coming on today. Um, before we jump into some like more specific questions, just tell the guests why why you were a good fit for the pod today. Why? why mental health is important to you. And obviously you were a lacrosse player and, and coaching now and still playing, but uh, let the guys know a little bit. Yeah. So um, I think mental health has become a paramount thing in coaching, uh, especially as a young coach. I think, you know, we talk a lot about athletes, mental health, and that's so important. Uh, but coaches as well have mental health that they have to worry about and balance with um what their athletes have and you know i i love coaching i would not change it for the world but there is some things that you know you put in perspective some days and it it does it does really take a toll on you um so no i i've been uh, watching for at least 30 episodes now i think i've gone back and watched most of them so i really appreciate what you guys are doing for for athletics as a whole. Uh, we deal with student athletes all the time, whether it's, you know, coaching them, working with them, playing with them. Uh, I unfortunately got taken out of the sport that I loved at a younger age due to injuries and uh, people taking, you know, some, some bad coaches that played on your mental health and whatnot. So it was really important for me. Uh, you know, I'm only 24 now. Um, but to get back into the game in some way. So when I was 19, I started 
Sorry, my dog is. No, it's okay. Uh, caused, causing some mayhem, but no, it was it was really important uh, for me Fox. to get back into the game and you know change change how we looked at it a little bit. So that's amazing. I love it, Jackie. Go ahead. I think it's interesting that you touched on coaches' mental health because I was thinking about it this week. Um, with all the controversy over the Lions Cowboys game last week, all the all the front pages of the um, one of these NFL games was all geared towards like the last call of the game and what should the coach have called and the referees made the bad call. And I started to think about, you know, we, we talk about like athletes mental health, but I don't think there's enough attention either around like everything that goes into these athletes being able to play the game, the coaches, the athletic trainers, the referees. Like, I think that that's another area of the sport too, that doesn't get enough attention. Like how do these coaches prepare themselves for big moments and big games? How do these referees prepare themselves for that? So I like that you, touched on that so that's maybe something we can like talk about today and touch on too yeah 100 percent. i think um it's one of the reasons too jackie for that kind of stuff you don't see a lot of coaches jump up level like you're coaching the nfl usually you played in the nfl you're coaching college you played in college and part of that is just that pressure right they're used to dealing with the pressure as a player and then they kind of um are able to parlay that into um coaching but you know the guys that end up coaching the NFL that didn't play there, man. They they worked their butt off for 20-plus years to actually get there. Um, so 100%, it, it's being used to your situations and, and kind of um, kind of being comfortable, I think, is where a lot of that comes from. But I saw I saw some of the same headlines you were talking about, Jack. Yeah, I was wondering kind of the same thing. That's funny. Um, yeah, well, they, were, they were saying, they were like, should we train these referees? Because, like, like you said, the coaches have experience, but they're like, these re- there should be a program for these referees because they're getting slander. They're getting like crapped on after all the games, like the players, like maybe we should have a program for them, like how to handle these situations better. Like, okay, you're a veteran referee. We'll put you in the big Super Bowl game. Maybe we won't put the young guy in the big playoff game. We'll start him off in week one and two. And I think that's a good idea. Well, it's something we do with our athletes too. You, know, you don't want to set them up for failure. Uh, you want to set your athletes up for success. You don't want to give them too much too soon. And you know, you're making sure, working on critical skills outside of just um, games that they're prepared for games when they go in. So a lot of that stuff goes along um, with what we're talking about today for sure. Um, Zach, if you don't mind me asking, when when did your injury take you out of lacrosse? 2015. So I, I was 15 years old. Um, so, yeah, I, I was a lacrosse goalie. Um, so – there's some concussion risks with uh, with playing lacrosse, as with any sport, really. Uh, no matter what level of contact, you always risk injury uh, in athletics, and it's just something that we take on. So, yeah, t- 2015 is when I stopped, and I took about four years off. And the, the mind of an athlete, I've been playing since I was four. So I, I just had to get back into it in some way, and that's that's kind of when the coaching journey started. Okay, that's amazing. Um, what made you want to get into coaching? Just just kind of staying intact with the sport, or was there a little bit more purpose there as well? Yeah, I, I wanted to give back. Um, you know, lacrosse gave me a lot in my playing days. I was provincial and national levels of the sport, um, and yeah, I, I thought, you know, how how can I stay involved in the game in 2019? What kind of spurred, like, I'm a women's lacrosse coach. What kind of spurred that? Because it's a little bit different between men's and women's because the women don't have as much contact. Um, but for me, I um, uh, was liaison for Scotland in the World Championship, um, the U20 World Championship in 2019 a year before the world kind of shut down. Um, so, yeah, that that gave me my first opening into um, kind of the women's side. And uh, I enjoyed that. And, you know, the the more technical approach to, to the women's side without contact and everything. So then I started talking to coaches uh, that were coaching at the university level in the States. Um, and kind of, you know, I learned something from everybody. Um, as I kind of went through and then I, I got my first kind of break when I went over to Cardiff um, to lead a program. We had three teams over there. So um, so it was a lot, 
Uh, it was only me there. I didn't have any assistant coaches. Um, so responsible for three teams while also being not, not a student athlete, but a student coach. Um, cause I was in law school over there as well. So took a lot of time. Um, but yeah, it was, it was all worth it in the end oh, and it's still going. So yeah, think- Zach, if, Zach, if you don't mind, yeah, I'm here boys and girls. What's going on guys? Um, can you guys hear, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah, go yeah, ahead, buddy. Here. Here's what I'll say. This has been a morning. I connected a little bit with Zach already, but Zach, I wanted to touch on this, man. You get this great opportunity, you know, the dream job, some would say, right? But then all of a sudden you realize there's going to be some down things. There's going to be some transition here. Talk about how you got through that adversity and what that meant to you and what you learned from that. Yeah, so I started coaching at university when I was 22. So for me, that meant I was coaching players that were my age, slightly younger, and some even older in graduate studies and everything like that. So me and know, Luke have def- me and Luke have definitely been there. That's for sure, hundred yeah. percent. I've had so, similar. <laughs> yeah. So it, you know, you, you're you get doubted by the players. You know, who is this? person coming in especially especially the parents the parents are like what's a 22 year old gonna teach my 23 year old so you have to take steps and you know I always come back to my five core values and that's what happens throughout every team they get sick of me talking about my five core values but if you constantly preach that and start a culture up you uh, you you can break through it I mean winning has a lot to do with it but I think young coaches or at least myself for sure right off the top it was how do I get the win we want to win you know there's nothing else to coaching than winning Um, and I I really had to stop and reset when we we started winning and then we started losing and that was affecting everybody in the team because the culture was built on winning and when you didn't win it wasn't fun so we we really had to take a step back and going down to coach my twos because as I say we had three teams, the twos and the threes really taught me, re showed me how to have fun with it and that spurred a culture throughout Cardiff Lacrosse, of, you know we want to win we want success that's what every athlete wants, but there's other things to it and like I, I said to Pat you know, when we were talking about flexibility this morning, I said, athletes adapt. That's what we do. So, yeah, I I think I got a little off track, a little off track there, but no, just, just regaining your culture and showing the athletes and the parents, you know, this is the direction that we're going. This is what we were brought in to do and win or lose, you get so much out of, athletics um but it, it's hard so yeah yeah that's um whenever i was a, a first time coach at university um my right after i graduated college so that would have been 2019 um i was also i guess i was 22 as, as well um i did not have as good a perspective as you i i was kind of one of the players i was one all about winning Right. And I wasn't starting in college. So that's kind of uh, hilarious in itself. Um, but, you know, yeah, Jackie's laughing at me over here. I'm laughing at myself. Uh, <laughs> but I was kind of a player that kind of rolled their eyes when you talk about culture and rolled their eyes whenever you talk about it's like, OK, we're out here to work. We're out here to win. It's like that's not really necessarily what it's about. Um, all the young athletes out there, I want you to listen to what Zach's saying. Because you have to have a base, right? You have to have a foundation to build off of. And that's what Zach's talking about here, right? You can roll your eyes when you talk about culture. You can roll your eyes when you talk about teamwork and stuff like that. But but that's what it's about. And that's the reason you're going to play for your team um, week in and week out. So, Zach, I, I think you hit the nail on the head there for sure. Jackie, what do you got? Uh, two things, too. I think when – I think when we're younger, when we're like 14, 15, 16, and we're playing sports and we're focused on winning and like for me, basketball, it's like who's going to hit the most threes today and you don't really want to hear and talk about culture. But I think I understood more of what my coaches said to me growing up the older I got. Like now that I'm in college and I'm part of 
Special Olympics and jobs and internships, like I've realized that that translates more into the real world than anything. And I think it's like, you don't really, it kind of like, is just like word vomit when you're a kid. But I think when you're older, it starts to make sense. And coaches too, any coaches that are listening too, like, listen to what we're saying here today, because like, it's okay to pivot as a coach. I think young coaches think that they come into the game and they have to know everything. And everyone does turn to a coach. The game's on the line, someone's hurt. We're doing subs. Like everyone turns to the coach. What are we going to do? But like Zach said, it's like you had to adjust and make changes to your culture. And that's how teams are successful because the coaches are willing to learn and make mistakes and pivot. And that's what young athletes and coaches need to see and be reminded of. So, so yeah, Jackie, that's, I love that. And I kind of want to um, sidebar off of that. For me, Zach, I think some of the toughest mental times I've had as a coach is not having the answers to an athlete's question. Uh, that's one of the things that, that really like, it makes me question myself. It makes me, you know, value myself a little bit less. Um, but also whenever, you know, you've got to make a hard substitution or you've got to bench a kid or you've got to start another kid over somebody that's working super hard. Like, you know, those are some of the things that were a struggle for me as a coach. What were some struggles um, for you as a coach coming into the game? Yeah, I had to bench my captain, and that's something that nobody was used to. I mean, o over in the UK, we play with, you know, less teams, and the talent is kind of more centralized. So, you know, the captain's used to playing 60 minutes um, on the pitch. But I think that it was a tough decision. But, you know, everybody has a rough game. And sometimes when people take it out on other people, you know, you have to have consequences. And I think that actually led to one of my values is trust. And that made everybody trust the process that nobody was above anybody else on the team. So as much as that was a hard decision, and that was like the first hard decision I had to make, um, but it's what I always go back to. Sometimes you, you do have to make a hard substitution and a substitution that people aren't going to like. Um, maybe initially, you know, parents doubt you, athletes doubt you. But when you go back to the locker room and you say, you, you see what we did, we started here, we ended here in a debrief setting, you know, everybody starts to see kind of what happened and, you know, collective responsibility is a huge thing for me. So, you know, we win as a team, we lose as a team. So anytime that there was something that compromised that, that action had to be dealt with immediately, which led definitely led to hard decisions and whatnot. But I always think of in-game substitutions as having, you know, 5% of the coach's role overall. I think there's so much to coaching that people don't always see that, you know, small decisions have big impacts and things we think are big decisions sometimes have really, really small impacts. So I think, you know, putting everything in perspective is something that kind of I tried to do every day and, you know, I'd make coaching journals every week or every day, depending on, you know, how the week was going. Uh, and just reminded myself, you know, why, why are we here? And it's, it all goes back to the five values. I love that. That's uh, I know both these guys got good points, but I got a funny thing for you. Like my college coach, you know, we're playing soccer and it's a lot like lacrosse. It's a team sport. You know, there's no I in team. Um, and he's a fiery guy. Anytime somebody would do something selfish, she said, if you want to go play uh, for yourself, you got to go play golf. He's like, that's not what we do over here in soccer. Um, Pat, Jackie, what do we got, guys? Yeah, I got something brief. I, I think it's uh, being a former college coach when I had players that were older than me. Um, I think the expectations are set day one. If you're running a good program, you set those expectations and you set the standards that they agree to. And if they, they fall short, you have to make sure the discipline is there, but you love on them twice as hard and understand that this game not only is tough, but you never know what's going on outside the pitch, outside the field, the court, whatever it may be. Zach, I love your perspective on that and sticking to your boundaries, but also going at it with approach and grace and gratitude because not everyone's like that when these athletes fall short. Uh, 
I think the Michigan example, I'm going to keep going back to the national championship. You see that kid last week botch the punt. Morgan, I think is his last name. He's one of their guys all year. And they complimented Harbaugh because they didn't go away from him. They didn't over-discipline him. They fed him back into the game, and he became a huge part of one of those key drives. So the point I'm trying to make is you set the expectation, you set the standard, but sometimes when they fall short, it's about the next move, the next thing, and handling that with approach and gratitude is where I want to go. So, Zach, I love that, man. I think, yeah, Pat, I think you're spot on, man. I think especially just using the football example, like if he makes a mistake like that, Make sure the next ball you get them is an easy catch, right? A little out route, three yard catch, boom, and the hands out of bounds, something like that. And that's that's on the coach, right? You got to set your players up for success, hundred percent. Right, and Zach, you're gonna, and this is something I didn't realize till after I was done coaching. I'm gonna make mistakes as a coach, so we set the standard that I'm gonna bring it every day. But if I make mistakes, I hope I have a player come over, which they did to me, and they say, Pat, it's okay, my man. We're all in this together. I think there's power in that unity, like you mentioned. I, you're saying a lot of stuff that I can completely understand and relate to. I think, I think yeah. that's the, in a young Go coach. Ahead. I think that's the beauty of being a young coach is you can have that dialogue with players a little bit. Yeah, no, for yep. sure. I think, uh, you know, everybody makes mistakes. And I worked with a sports psychologist when I was over there. You know, the first couple of mistakes hit you hard and, you know, I still have nightmares about coaching, you know, and it's just something that probably will always affect you. Everybody says compartmentalize. It just doesn't work. You know, you care about these 20, 30, however many athletes you got on the pitch uh, and on the team. You care about them so deeply that if you make a mistake, then, you know, you think about it and it just consumes you. So I did have to work with sports psychologists to, you know, help me be a better coach because if I'm still thinking about something that happened five minutes ago, it's not, you know, in the moment in the game, right? So, so you know, making mistakes as a coach is a real thing. And sometimes, you know, the team, you talk about it and the team's like, yeah, no worries. And, you know, sometimes you're too afraid to talk about it, especially as a young coach, you know, you're like, I know I made a mistake there, but I'm just going to let it be. But no, I think talking about it um, and, you know, having that open communication and dialogue, especially, you know, if you bring them into your office and you say, look, I know you made a mistake here, but this was really good. You can also say, but look, I made a mistake here, too. Everybody makes those mistakes at the end of the day. You know, we're all human, you know, Dan Campbell and everybody. We talked about the Lions a little bit earlier. Uh, everybody makes mistakes, refs make mistakes, and so, yeah. Yeah, handling those situations with grace. Jackie, I saw you come off. You got some comments? I know this is what we touched on a few minutes back um, when we were kind of all bouncing off each other, but I just wanted to mention, because it made me think of it, I don't know, Zach, if you're familiar with, like, the New England Patriots dynasty or if, how big you are into football, but I began watching the man in the arena the Tom Brady docu uh, docu series on ESPN Plus, and I think everybody should just watch the very first episode because it it's all about how Tom Brady was the backup quarterback and how he showed up and did his job, and the moment came and he ended up taking over Drew Bledsoe's um, spot, and Drew Bledsoe is a Hall of Famer, and the whole episode is just about how Drew Bledsoe continued to lead, and even though he was older than Tom Brady, more experienced, Tom Brady got to start in the Super Bowl over him, and just like how he carried himself with just like grace and class throughout that whole thing. It's such a good example for coaches and athletes. And he just like completely led Tom Brady through that whole season. But I think it goes back to the fact that that's what their team culture was. Like they knew if this is best for the team for Tom to start, Tom's going to start. And I just need to help him in any way I can. And if that means I'm helping him by coaching him from the sidelines and that's what my coaches need for me, then that's what I'm going to do. I just think everybody should watch that first episode of that series because it's such a good example of that, especially at such a high level of sports. Yeah, I love that. Sure. I agree. And look, if you don't mind, I, I kind of want to parlay off that with I, I know in the beginning of the episode I was still on a plane runway in uh, Chicago, so I apologize for that, but 
Zach, if I heard correctly, you are now out of college coaching. You are now out of coaching entirely. And if I remember our previous conversation, it was because of some of the stuff that we're touching on. Um, if you wouldn't mind, can you go into that and kind of what happened to an extent and what you're doing now, if you guys are cool with that too? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that's fine. So I did take a break from uh, from university coaching. Um, you know, I, I was away from home. I'm a Canadian um, national. Uh, so I, I missed four Christmases. So it was nice this year to be back for back for the holidays and everything. So yeah, it was it was just a lot. Um, you know, you, you learn so much on the job. Uh, you know, sometimes it just gets so draining. Um, and if I were to do it again, I'd definitely take another approach at it. Uh, I'm doing some high school stuff right now. Um, you know, I I tried to you know take a full season off from coaching and. That just didn't work for me uh, because, you know, you still love to have your um, your athletic time and uh, giving back to the game, coming back into my hometown, all the high schools that, you know, I played against or I uh, went to. So it's been really fun to uh, to come back and, you know, t take another little bit of a reset, you know, as I mentioned, going from the premier division the division one uh, with the top Cardiff. And then, you know, you'd go to a practice with the twos and they just want to have fun and you'd have fun drills. And then you think about, well, the ones want to have fun too. So, you know, resetting it and going into it with building from the ground up. Um, you know, my family, I, I missed trips because, you know, we were in the playoffs or even the regular season, you know, uh, and again, as I mentioned off the top, I wouldn't change any of it for the world. Uh, I love coaching um, and everything, but I I just needed at least a year to kind of take take a rest from the the university pressures. Um, I've looked at um, moving to the states and doing um, coaching uh, a women's across university. Um, whatever division that may be. Uh, I also have a law degree, as I mentioned. So uh, I just wanted to, you know, reset a little bit, move home. Um, but no, it, it was it was a lot of the pressures that kind of said, you know, we went, uh, we had a really good run. Our twos went to uh, the championship game last year, uh, coming up just short. Uh, but it, it was a really good run. And I thought, you know, now's the time I had a lot of seniors graduating, um, so I, I just said that I need a little bit of a reset, uh, and then we'll we'll see where life goes next year. But no, I, I'm really enjoying you know working with with the high schoolers, um, you know, teaching them how to get to the to that university level uh, has been really fun since I moved back. I think that's yeah, that's an invaluable experience that the high schoolers you're working with can learn from now. Um, and I, I love what you touch on there. I kind of want to parlay a little bit off that. Um, go back to the sports psychologist part. If that's cool, Pat, or do you want to, you got another thing for this real quick? Yeah, with that, bro, let's roll. Uh, so so kind of walk me through, you know, if you've got a, a tip or two that the sports psychologist gave you when you were working with them to how to really improve your mental game or your, or your coaching back in the day. Yeah, I, I uh, touched on it a little bit. I, I journal all the time. You know, I, every thought that's in my mind, you know, an hour after the rest of the team goes home, it all goes down on paper. And whether that paper sticks or whether that paper gets thrown out or um, I've set a few pieces of paper safely on fire and just let it burn. Um, so, you know, I, but I, I think writing it down, getting it out of my head, because again, the, as a coach, there's a lot of stuff that, like, I'm not going to take it out on my athletes. They've got far more stuff to think about than, you know, I didn't get, you know, this call right. I called a timeout here when I should have called it here. You know, all, all the minor little details, but the stuff that will consume you if you just let it kind of boil under the surface. Um, 
like I, I always talk about that there's a game we won by a lot, like a, a, a very significant margin. Um, and the other team was playing with a suspended player. And my team told me, and I said, you know, it, like uh, they wouldn't be doing that kind of a thing. I, I just shrugged it off because we were in the game. And that consumed me for months, you know, thinking about how the players came to me and told me something and I didn't do anything about it, even though I was wrong in the end. So that was a situation that I really had to go back and reflect in myself. And uh, I found journaling really helped that, writing everything down. Um, so that, that's the technique that I've used kind of mostly is just, you know, verbal diarying, not even thinking about what goes into the journal, just saying, you know, this was a mediocre day, I'm going to write a page, or this was a really awful day, I'm going to write three pages and just not stop. Just get everything out of your mind in three pages and then kind of leave it at the office. I love that. I always struggle with journaling because, and I, I try to do it quite a bit. Uh, me and Pat have talked about this before. I think I talked about it last January or February on the podcast, but I always struggle like putting everything I'm thinking on there. Like you said, not even worrying about it. Just put your thoughts on there. That's always, I always kind of hold back a little bit at first and you notice like a paragraph in, you actually get what you're thinking out. And uh, I, I love that tip. Jackie, what do you got? Yeah, same here. I used to, I think the thing with journaling too and a lot of wellness techniques is that we kind of think it has to be this perfect thing. Like I'm going to write a good paragraph every day, whatever. It's like, just do it so that you're getting the thoughts out. Like do it for you. Don't do it. So it has to be perfect or right every time. It's just about not like you said, Zach, like compressing every, keeping everything in and to the point where like it just builds up and builds up, like just let it out. And if you need to throw the paper out, throw it out. If you want to keep it, that's fine. But don't even worry so much about the act of it. Just just do it. And like Luke said, things will flow after you get through the first paragraph and just keep consistently chipping away at it. Right. Yeah, I love I, that. I love that reset piece that you touched on. Go ahead. That's amazing. Yes, sir. Yeah, no, I was just going to say like that's I kept a lot of my first ones, but I found myself going back and being like, did you really need to say that? So now, even if I keep them, I don't go I back to you. them, which is why <laughs> most of them get thrown out because I'm just like, okay, I got it out. You know, I'm, I don't want to look at this again. It's out of my mind now. So that's why I throw most of mine out just because, you know, that's between me and the piece of paper and, you know, future, future me or somebody else doesn't need to read it because I, I just need to get it out. And, you know, that's when, you know, if you're mad about something, that's you, you just write it down and throw it away after that's a good tip and uh i like to burn the little piece of paper if you got to just burn it get, you've written it down you've thought about it you've processed it let's get it out let's move on to the next step and uh it, i guess sometimes it's hard to cut the loss right like it's something that you're you're festering or that's festering in you and it, it's hard to cut it out and and just move on so that's that's a great physical way to to kind of uh, visualize that um absolutely love it and zach i i think you know what's what's been a a great mental health experience while coaching you know we'd like to talk about the bad stuff on here and kind of get it out there and let people know that that um they're not alone and that you know everybody's struggling a little bit but what's some great mental health times that you've had coaching you know like uh the first thing that came to mind was when we won our semifinal uh, to go to the championship last year a team that wasn't expected to do much further furthest a team from wales has ever gone uh, as far as i'm told as far as records go um so uh, you know that's that's the first thing but i think you know if you reflect a little bit more on the question it is every day in practice if you see somebody get that little bit better i think that's that's what keeps me going in coaching you know who knows what my win loss record is i i don't care about my, my win loss record at the end of the day that's not going to you know if i say in 10 years you know we went 12 and 2 or w whatever you know that doesn't 
matter at the end of the day. But it, if you can go back and have, you know, alumni games or whatever, and even after you're done, you know, you see them continuously getting that little bit better, whether it's on the lacrosse field or better people or better employees or, you know, at any time you can see improvement. I think that's what most coaches, I think that's what we want at the end of the day, uh, which is what I, what I had to learn because, you know, that win loss record, it was like, well, I love coaching in Wales, but coaching in Wales doesn't give me a lot of money. So going to the States, they're going to want my win loss record. But when you think too much about your win loss record, you lose everything, you know, the players don't want to come to practice because you're hounding them. You know, you're doing the same thing over and over again. You're not doing anything fun. You know, um, Kelly Amonte Hiller, the national champion this year, head coach of Northwestern. You know, I saw her at practice doing flag football, you know, something completely unrelated to lacrosse, but building up that culture so much in one game because it, it brings you together and you you drop the sticks and you just do something else. So that's when it kind of shifted for me from, you know, that win-loss record. At the end of the day, that doesn't matter. It's how much of a difference can you make in each of your athletes um, that come through your program? Because some of them I only got for a year. Some of them you get for four or five years. So how much of a difference can you have in that short amount of time? Absolutely. Absolutely. Jackie, what do you got? Yeah, this reminds me of my high school basketball team. I had a very, very knowledgeable head coach, like probably one of the most basketball intelligent IQ men I've ever met. And we were really good. We were like, I want to say we were, we went like 17 and three that season, but it got to a point where people weren't having fun. Like the really competitive, talented players on the team were having fun, like we're, weren't even having a ton of fun. And then just down from there, JV freshman, nobody was having fun because the practices were the same. The coach was just tense and used to coaching like high level teams. Hadn't really dealt with a whole girls basketball program, like in a long time. And I'm pretty sure it happened because one of our assistant coaches kind of put a bug in his ear, like the girls aren't having fun. And it took a lot for him to kind of like step down, and give us, we had like a fun practice where he like everyone dressed up in like a silly outfit. We played knockout and he gave us like a Dunkin' Donuts gift card and kind of talked to us after. And you could tell it took a lot out of him to do that. But I think it was a learning moment for him because he realized like, yes, systems are important and repetitions are important and consistency, but like it's okay to pivot if things aren't going well and people aren't having fun, like remembering that sports are supposed to be fun too. It's okay to like play flag football with your team or like have a game of knockout and just remind people why they're here. Cause I think people, it's good to trust the process, but sometimes you can really get lost in it too. Yeah. We, we kind of found ourselves in that kind of a rut, Jackie and uh, Zach back in. Uh, we start, we're going to start workouts in January. So I think we did the same thing last year. So, you know, we're March about three months in and me and Jared looked at each other, the head coach at web and we were like, man, we haven't done anything like super fun in the last couple weeks or last month. And we started playing like handball as a warm up game, the first 15 minutes. And, you know, it's a great way to get them active, get them using athletic muscles so that they're getting warmed up for the practice. But at the same time, they're having a good time. Um, so I, I absolutely love that. Um, you know, the, the keep going podcast, right? We want to know, um, about the past. We want to know about your mental health struggles, but we also want to know, you know, why do you do what you do? Why do you keep going, Zach? Yeah, I think, um, that one, that one moment that, you know, I always go back to is the, the last year that I played, I had a really, um, unfortunate experience with a coach who, you know, didn't put time into people wanted wanted the wins and nothing else and you know it it sent a lot of us to never touch a stick again and so for me I um, always knew that I didn't want that to be my last memory of lacrosse it was something that I'd done for 10 years um, so that's why I, I always knew that it wasn't going to be the end for me when I, when I stopped playing 
at a younger age. Um, but, you know, it led me to want to make a difference. And that's why I, I ended up getting into coaching four years after I stopped. Um, and even a little bit before that, and like my sister played house league and, you know, doing some of that stuff. So, you know, it was just to, to keep going and not let one bad thing ruin me and my vision of lacrosse, but also not let other people have similar coaching experiences to what I had if I was going to be their coach. So that's why I, I ended up pursuing that route was to, to ensure that, you know, if somebody came to my program, I didn't want them to come to me mid season and say, look, I'm not having fun doing lacrosse anymore. I'm done, you know, and just accepting it. Like, some of the players that I played with did, you know, uh, people probably don't know. Peterborough is, is such a lacrosse town. Um, you know, everybody plays lacrosse, uh, but we did have a high turnover with some bad coaches. Um, and, you know, so that's, that's what I, I wanted to do when I, when I set out to get back into the game was to make sure that if, if I was their coach, that they wouldn't have a similar experience. Love it. I'll I'll say this, and you know I'm I, once again I, this has happened a couple episodes of late where I just catch myself listening. That's one of the most selfless things I've ever heard on this podcast. Like the fact that that was your mindset and that was your perspective. And what Zach, you said earlier, you're in your mid twenties, correct? You're twenty five. Yeah. You said twenty four. Twenty four. I apologize. I think that's incredibly selfless and not only to not let it ruin you and not get, I, you know, taken up by that identity piece, but also for players and coaches in your program, you were willing to put it all on you and say, Hey, you've trusted me. I'm going to show up every day and represent what we do and how we do things. I I'm in, I'm jealous of that because that's something I wish I would have done better when I was put in a similar chair. So for athletes and listeners here today, this is what it takes to lead these great programs. You care about your people. At the end of the day, you care about your people, but you have to care about yourself as well and understand what it takes. And Zach, I, I think that was, like, I'm very touched by that. So I appreciate you sharing that and being vulnerable. Jay, go ahead. I think that being selfless is something that's kind of gotten lost in sports today where, you know, we have social media and stats and people are like we have 13 year olds trying to get recruited for sports. And so it's refreshing to hear you say that that's why you're doing what you do, because I think a lot of people get caught in being involved in sports sometimes for the wrong reasons. And it's about them and how they look and are portrayed to others. So it, it was really refreshing and nice and I have a lot of respect for you that you're able to come on and say that like, yeah, I didn't maybe have a great experience with my sport as much as I wanted to, but I found a way to stay involved to help the game of lacrosse and help athletes and pretty much keep sports being what they should be. So I have a lot of respect for you for coming on here and talking about that. And basically that being your why. 100%. Yeah. Um, Zach, I know you've got to, uh, got to run here in a little bit and I appreciate you taking all the time. Uh, this Sunday morning um, and really you know you've been a listener for, for a long time and we appreciate your support um, through listening but also we appreciate the support of you getting on today it's not easy to talk about um, the struggles that you've been through and, and how you've grown and, and things like that it, it's it's not an easy thing to do I, I assume you're kind of feeling that right now as you're on the other side of the camera um, I know we're kind of what wrapping up here if there's one thing that you want to tell um, the student athletes and, uh, and specifically the coaches that a lot of people are going to be um, in your position the next couple of years, right? There's a lot of turnover in college coaching right now. There's a lot of turnover in high school coaching right now. You know, what's a piece of advice that you would give new coaches stepping into the role? Yeah, it, it would be that your wins and losses won't follow you forever. You know, you think it will, but it won't. Uh, the relationships that you build, are things that will stick with you and you know you you need 
these athletes to, or you don't need them, but uh, I feel like I need them to have a good experience coming through my program. Um, so at the end of the day, building that culture piece uh, and focusing on, on things that, that are tough to focus on. Like we, we were very open and frank about mental health and the role of the student athlete, their students first, their athletes second. Um, you know, I, I think about the charities that have started um, through through tragedy, you know, Morgan's message, Morgan Rogers was a lacrosse player at Duke. Um, and, you know, mental health wasn't talked about enough. Um, so for, for me, it's, it's being completely open and, you know, let it, having enough trust in your players that they can trust you to share whatever they want, um, whatever they feel they need to, and having those tough conversations uh, while building the culture and not focusing as much on wins and losses at the end of the day. So, yeah, I, yeah, I absolutely love that too. That's an amazing cap off because I think it's, it gets lost in, you know, in translation sometimes, right? Especially from the coaches. I got to keep my job. I got to win. I got to win. I got to win. What keeps your job is building and growing young men and women to get to where they want to be in life. And once we lose sight of that, we've totally lost what college athletics is all about. So I love your perspective there. And I love, hopefully when you get back into the swing of things, that second time around, Zach, you double down there and continue to make an impact because I know you're doing a great job now, man. And I, and I didn't say that earlier. Thank you for all the love and support for our podcast because it, it means the world. You've been here literally since day one, and I, I don't forget that. And I, and I really appreciate that. So thank you for trusting in us and, and using us as a resource. We appreciate it. Appreciate you guys. Being a regular on the podcast, uh, I got a shout out. Episode 59, uh, Mikey Schlosser, lacrosse player, lacrosse legend. And I was going to oh, steal okay. Pats, probably. I was going to steal Pats because we're both Bears D guys. I was going to take Riverboat Ron Rivera as well. Uh, Zach, are you, a, are you, Zach, are you a Bears guy? I'm a Bears guy, through and through. Dude. Oh, man. Dude, oh, okay. <laughs> we're going to have to go another hour here because we got a big game today. We got a big yeah, game cancel, today. Cancel whatever you got, Zach. It's, it's beat packed yeah. today, I guess. It's beat packed. <laughs> I'm going to say this, and of course you're a Bears guy. I absolutely love that. Riverboat Ron Rivera is a great call-out, uh, number 59. I, I, here's what I'll say today. I have to ask you now that we're here. Are you a Fields guy? I am. Oh, I am. no. I, I, uh -oh. I, still, I, I still think he has got it in him. Um, I'm not a big Caleb guy. Um, you know, I, I – um, when he threw out about the ownership piece is when he kind of lost me yeah. uh, as a guy. I, I don't think there's Retweet. a quarterback in the class that I would trust more than Justin Fields. I'm not a Matt Eberflus guy. I'll, I'll tell you that. I'm not a Matt Eberflus uh, guy. All right. Uh, all right. All right. All right. We're, we're on the exact same page. Yeah. I don't know many people who are Eberflus people anymore. <laughs> no, not even close. It, Zach, in all serious, man, in all serious, man, I, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you dealing with my flexibility. Um, I know this was a hour after we were supposed to get started. Here's the last thing I want to ask you. It's been something that I've been asking all of our guests and Jackie and Luke have been doing the same. We're trying to do a better job of this. Talk to me about how we can help you. Um, we want to help you whatever way we can. You've been an avid listener. You've been a fantastic guest and a resource for us today. I know I've got a lot out of this. I know our listeners will as well. How can we help you, bro? I think just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, you know, keep raising the awareness that uh, that you are around uh, the mental health and athletes. Because again, you know, this, this is like a five-year thing. You know, five years ago, we weren't talking about mental health as much as we are now. So I'd say just keep, keep on keeping on, guys. Uh, you know, we're at episode 59 now. I'd love to see episode 100, episode 200, you know. Just keep going. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank hey, you, I love you. Like every other guest, he's humble. He's humble. He's humble. Yeah. <laughs>
we're going to help you out in any way we can. We're going to shout the pages out. We're going to shout any team that you end up coaching out um, as well, Zach. And we appreciate the support, man. Yeah, 100%. It, it's not often, Zach, where we have someone on here where I just sit here. I'm like, this guy is a beautiful human being. Like, just a genuine dude. Yeah. So, like Luke said, if we can ever support your program with fundraising stuff or getting stuff out on social media, let us know. We're that group. We're trying to do a better job in 2024, so we appreciate 100%. it. 100%. Appreciate nice. you guys. Have a, good, have a good new year. Hope you had a good holidays. We didn't cover that at the beginning, but no, – Yeah, 100%. We're good, so – well, I'll, I'll end it with the only cap off I know on a Sunday in bear country. Bear down, baby. Let's go. Oh, bear, man. Down. bear down. <laughs> bear down. Keep going, guys. Appreciate, Love you, guys. Love you, Appreciate you. Keep going, Bye. guys.